Hey everybody, in this video we're going to be covering sidelines of the Austrian attack of the Czech Pirk. Um, notice here we have the beginning position of the Austrian attack. Now if you haven't seen the main lines video um, that comes before this, you should go back and watch that first because throughout this video I might make reference to, um, let's say, variations or ideas that I covered in that video, and so it'll help your understanding if you've seen that video first. So after Queen a5, which is our move, and the main lines video, we covered mainly the move bishop to d3, and in this video, we're going to be covering um, bishop d2 and the critical e5 line. So let's just start with bishop to d2, because uh, it's a bit easier, so uh, I can kind of warm up the video here with that. We play um, the standard e5. So what's going on here? It's very similar to what happens in the main lines, but just with the difference of the bishop being on d2 rather than d3. So right off the bat, I want to say that um, discoveries uh, are not dangerous. Um, discoveries against our queen are not dangerous for us. And let's just look at some of these lines. After knight to d5, you play the simple queen to d8, knight takes f6, and queen takes f6. So from this position, there are a couple liquidations um, possible. If um, white takes f takes e5, um, we'll reach a position that we reach um, through transposition um, after some of the other lines later. So I'm not going to cover that this very second, but I will cover um, d takes e5, d takes e5, and then here on knight f3. So just to highlight here that why well, can't do the double liquidation because of a queen h4 would be very uncomfortable. I'm going to pick up the e4 pawn. Uh, even better if they play g3 here. So this is already better for white, <laughs> for black, I mean. So yeah, so after d takes e5, we have uh, knight to f3. And then here we can simplify pretty easily after taking on f4. Um, best here for white is just to play e5. To force us back to d8. And so the positions that arise from here are kind of defined by, um, by when white recaptures on f4. So it's not so great for white if they do it right away. Um, you can see that we can get into this kind of variation where we'll play knight to d7 first instead of bishop e6 because um, white knight can come to d4 and harass our bishop on e6 after knight to d7, let's say bishop c4. So now there might be some sort of threats of on knight to g5. We can kick the bishop back and play a timely bishop e7. So now knight g5 can be met by castles. And after something like castles and castles, notice that um, white has this isolated pawn. Once we catch up in development by developing our bishop here onto um, one of these squares, then it's, um, I think, white's activity is the only thing that's really compensating this weakness. And the resulting middle games are pretty pretty nice. We just have to be careful about moving the rook from f8 because f7 is a bit of a soft point. And um, at some point, we can maybe even try to harass the bishop on b3 to get rid of um, the fact that our rook has to kind of babysit here. So this position is pretty good for black. So taking on f4 too early is not recommended. Um, best for white is to play bishop to c4. And here we play b5 and bishop back to d3. So you might be wondering what what if um, white just plays bishop to d3? And we'll get pretty much the same positions um, without um, b5 included. And that's just a, a little more solid for us. Um, this queenside expansion isn't super necessary. And we'll see where that comes in, that factors into the variation. So after bishop to c4, b5, bishop comes to d3, and just simply um, bishop to e6. You'll notice that. After bishop to e6, this will be white's um, last real chance to take on f4 um, before we play g5. And we can't play g5 right away because of just h4, and we get opened up and it's not very comfortable. So what we're waiting for is um, for white to castle here. So bishop f4 will be the last um, chance. We'll just look at that um, pretty briefly. Last chance to take on f4. And here we just play knight a6, and notice that we're coming to um, one of these outpost squares. The, see, this is the difference um, if their pawn had been on, let's say, um, b7. 
it'd be even more solid and we'd have nothing to worry about here. Black um, at least has to do something about the c6 pawn. In the meantime, when um, bishop to e4 is played, knight b4 is the best move, and we're coming to d5. So even if we get kicked, it's not like we're losing protection of, of the pawn here. So um, even with b5 included, it's not so bad for us. And um, problem, this is better than, than trading. Um, we can trade. Um, if white trades with us, that's even better. And if white doesn't trade, well, then maybe your queen just comes to b6 and um, makes castling difficult for white. So we don't have to worry about the tension between the queens. So, but if white doesn't take that opportunity um, to grab f4 and plays instead um, castles, well, now we can hold on to it with g5. And it's not easy for white to do something about this because um, without this rook operating on the file, um, when h4 is played, we can play h6. So an example line I'll give here, just queen e1, we can play bishop e7 to offer more support to the g5 point. If they attack you on the queen side, you just push. Um, white could take here, but um, that might just run into trouble after queen to b6, which is why they play uh, king to h1, and now we have time to defend. So it's a logical sequence. Um, and here's a really nice rook lift. Instead of moving our queen off, we can get a rook doing something by bringing it to d7. And this pretty much ends the example line here. After, let's say, queen e2, we can play queen c7. And this is just an example of how we uh, untangle and are left with pretty much no problems. Let's say this liquidation happens. This isn't something you have to memorize, but um, just as an example to show that um, black is doing very well here with the extra pawn. Um, we never even had to do anything with their king um, because of the um, blockade in the center. And from here, we could figure out whether or not we want to bring our king um, maybe to g7. Um, maybe not castle. Our rook is fine for the moment here, um, operating um, on the h file in case we ever want to do some sort of expansion. But castling is probably fine as well. Maybe we could double up on this pawn. Just always being in mind, um, keeping in mind that white might try to open us up if our king is left too exposed. But here with the rook operating on the sixth rank, it's not a problem. So this is the kind of position you can just evaluate for yourself. Um, being, since that's an example, it's not really worth going into a uh, concrete analysis of exactly what's going on. So a lot of moves are played there, so I'm going to back that up. So that's pretty much what happens if you um, do this discovered attack. And so I think I've shown that it's not something to be feared. Maybe better is uh, not to play it again. Maybe better is to play d takes e5 right away. And let's say f5. So after f5, white has tried to close things down, make development for us hard, but um, this leaves the problem of after queen to b4, uh, what happens with these pawns? So I'm going to show here that the any liquidation is um, going to be completely fine for black or in our favor. Probably the best move for white is the counterattack. Something like um, bishop to d3 is not good enough. Our queen can escape back in time. F3 now. Bishop to b4, you can see this pawn becomes weak. And after uh, knight to e2 to protect the pawn indirectly, just bishop c5, this would already be a huge advantage um, for, for black. If instead of knight f3, maybe something like g4, we always have h6, and they can't push forward as long as the rook is um, just this typical motif of the rooks um, being behind the pawns. Um, so you don't have to worry about a move like that. If something like a3, um, we can also just take, and so this is the idea, knight f3, and they threaten this really cute uh, knight a4 motif where our queen gets trapped, but we just need to know to bring it back after e, uh, knight takes e5, and we can trade that off. Uh, after all these exchanges, we have have lost a center pawn for a wing pawn, but the remaining center pawns here are, are pretty uh, weak for white. Um, we have good control over e5, and we'll be able to play against those weaknesses later. So 
playing for f5 is probably not in uh, white's favor. If instead the double liquidation, this is going to be um, very similar to the ideas um, that happened in these variations where the bishop is on d3 rather than d2, which was covered in the mainline video, where we don't want to take back on e5 with the queen. We want to do it with the knight. Now, I will say that, that there is a little difference here with all these extra discoveries between the bishop and the knight. We'll find that probably um, best is um, knight bishop to c5 rather than knight takes e5. And after bishop to c4, um, which is a move, queen e2 is also a move, but um, just because we were threatening this really uncomfortable knight to f2. But after just check and come back, we have a pretty good position here. Um, we can recover the pawn later, and because the white king is so stranded, it's not an issue um, that we are down upon. I guess after my analysis, though, I did see that uh, unfortunately, probably the best here in the specific position is a sequence that ends in repetition. So, and that looks like after um, knight to f2. Um, I will say here that bishop to f2 isn't as good um, with the king coming to uh, e2 because after we extract our bishop, um, with the bishop already on c4, they're able to make some immediate threats um, to us. So in fact, the king isn't so weak here on e2 because we're so underdeveloped. So best is knight to uh, f2. Um, queen e2, when we take the rook, queenside castle, um, white's able to go all in here. This, this is where the discovery matters as a difference. And this is what the computer recommends. This repetition between queen d8, bishop g5 is best for both sides. Otherwise, black is just up material. So this is the one unfortunate thing about um, the specific variation where it seems like the best we have is a perpetual, but um, it's pretty unlikely that you'll get this anyways. So I wouldn't worry about uh, having a single draw variation in a sea of variations um, that arise from these positions. And that was also really complicated. It's unlikely that White would go into that um, just seeing that knight to f2 was a threat in the first place. They'd have to calculate a lot just to see that um, perpetual is the best that they have. So don't worry about that. I just wanted to show that as an example. So let me back up here. So that pretty much handles the liquidations in the center, um, except for uh, f takes e5. So this is what I was talking about before, um, where I would uh, do some positions by transposition after knight to d5, which is probably best, takes, takes, and knight f3. Um, we take on d4, which is pretty much the common theme when they pile up on e5. It's um, We just take whatever pawn was um, was uh, left on f4 or e5. So here, um, bishop c4 is probably best. I had this in a blitz game, actually, once where my opponent played uh, bishop to g5, and this is actually a dubious move. And I was very happy to have found in the blitz game the uh, refutation, which is just um, bishop to b4 and c3, and you have to see that there's this nice d takes c3 when, uh, move where after they take us on f6, we get to play c2. And it looks like this. And um, black's going to go into a pawn up endgame. However, we um, retrieve the queen or the bishop, um, we've, we've gained this extra pawn. Um, on c3. So it's definitely not something you need to worry about, but a nice motif to have in your mind. Best move is bishop to c4, and um, just bishop to g4, pinning the knight. So I'm showing this variation because although it's um, maybe something that's rare and not necessarily good for white, it can look a little dangerous not with, our, with the way that the pieces are getting lined up. Um, for the moment, this isn't a huge problem, though, because um, the bishop is pinning the knight to the queen, so there's no real discovery happening. So um, bets is knight to d7, and once white gets out of the pin, you just have to play queen to e7. And don't worry about blocking your bishop, because more than likely we'll just queenside castle um, to avoid any problems there. So let's look at a couple variations. Um, let's look at just knight to g5. So very straightforward, lots of pressure here, but the solution's pretty simple. Just f6, let's say knight to f7, 
then we have this really nice move, knight to e5. So knight takes h8 is just a mistake because we're going to get two pieces um, for um, for the rook. And of course, if they just take on e5, then we have no issues. So what if instead bishop f7? Well, um, this is actually quite tricky for white because now they have to do something about defending the bishop um, once their knight moves. So here they have to counterattack, but then we still have knight e5. And after this sequence, um, notice that it'd be hard for us to take on uh, b4, as long as our queen and king are lined up like that. Sorry, by b4 I mean g5 squares. Gotta get my squares right. Um, because the bishop would take back and uh, would skewer um, or pin the queen to the king. So instead we can just play h6, and once the knight retreats, we can um, chop that off. And um, black's even a little better here. Our king is not in huge danger, and um, what's happened here is that we've actually just gone up a pawn. So um, once we figure out some consolidation for our king, let's say bring it to c7, and bring our rook over to the file. If white plays for f4, then e4 becomes really weak. So um, yeah, uh, trust me, black is a little better here. Computer confirms. So this isn't isn't working for white. So knight to g5 isn't um, much of a threat. Let's say instead they play um, knight takes d4, which makes a lot more sense. Here we just have knight e5 again. After the bishop retreats, queenside castle. We're attacking the knight on d4, c3, and then we can just play queen to e8 um, to get our bishop out. And just everything's really solid, and we're playing against this weakness. Our king is a little open, but um, our bishops do a good job of controlling these um, attacking diagonals, so I wouldn't be overly worried um, about any of that. So backing up here, what line have I not covered? That's pretty much the, um, the gist of all the liquidations here, and the discovered attacks. So let's go straight into um, knight to f3. And so you'll see a stark um, uh, similarity to the main lines, again with the bishops being on d2 um, rather than d3. And so, but I recommend the same move here of e takes d4, and you'll see where um, we get very similar positions. Uh, in this case, they're slightly better for us because um, now b2 is especially weak, seeing as that the bishop is on d2. And because the bishop isn't developed, uh, it's usually in our favor. However, after knight to b3, um, yeah, actually, I'll start with knight to f3. Um, so, because this is important, I don't think we should actually take on b2 here. That, let's just look at what, the, what happens here. After rook to b1, queen a3. Um, it does matter now that the bishop is on d2. The weakness on b2 is more in the knight to b3 lines. Um, here, after e5, um, white gets a really powerful attack. Um, we're going to get opened up, and at the right moment, we'll have a knight coming in, a rook coming in. So this is not, not recommended. Instead, I think we can just play very simply with bishop to e7, um, bishop to e3, and you'll notice that white still has a problem here. As long as our queen sits on b6, uh, even though we're not taking the pawn, um, because f4 has been played, white has trouble castling. So after bishop to d3, knight to uh, d7, queen e2 to play bishop to e3, but we have knight to c5. Um, so they play queenside castles, kingside castles, and we'll get a position like this where um, we're completely fine. And Something like this might happen. Um, queen problem we shouldn't take because we just have here and taking on a2. Um, important point here is that b3 is not possible, trapping your bishop because that would be checkmate. So probably instead of taking on d5, um, we'll see like something like king b1. And after bishop e6, black would be fine here. Um, it's a really interesting dynamic with both of us having a weak pawn. But we have two bishops, and even though the white knight can sit nice on d4. We have, I think, the easier time attacking uh, attacking the king with our queenside expansion because our rooks are already ready to be positioned on the king side, and white's rooks are actually in the center, which paradoxically makes it a bit hard for the attack on the king side. So black is fine here. 
Yeah, you'll notice that I'm speaking pretty fast as I run these variations because there's a lot of ground I want to cover. And a lot of these variations aren't super relevant, just kind of theoretically, um, you should know that solutions exist. So more likely than knight f3 is um, that you'll see knight b3. And of course, like in the main lines, we play a5. And probably white should play a4. Now I will say that after queen to e2 and a4 and bishop to e3, we have the first difference between the main line where in the main line I recommended the move queen to b4, but there's a huge difference here where after queen to b4, this doesn't really work because a3 is just really strong, um, putting our queen in trouble. In the main line, we had this really um, good resource of taking on b3, but here um, you'll notice that the bishop is on f1 rather than d3, and so we're not winning the second rook, and the king um, can just go somewhere, and we've lost a, a queen for a rook and a piece, a knight in this case, and it's not going to be enough. So I do not recommend playing that. Here we can just play queen to c7 though, and even though we go backwards like this, you'll notice that um, white's development is a little funky, and castle and queenside is going to be um, pretty difficult. For now, they have to deal with the threat on their knight, so they either play knight to d2 or d4, probably not knight to c1. Let's start with knight to d4. Um, we're going to be playing this move a3 to soften them up on the queen side. So after b takes a3, of course, we can just take back rook takes. And notice that we're attacking the knight on c3, so knight might come back to b3. There could be 7 and just castle, and this is a pretty good position for us. If instead b3, whoops, that was not the same. Again, bishop b7, uh, queen f3 to get the bishop out, castles, bishop d3. Um, and then we can start our expansion on the queen side. Probably we're going to have our knight coming out to a6. Now, there is a key point here where, um, just to be aware, after knight to d2, this is slightly different, because after a3, um, most likely they'll play um, b3, but um, b takes a3, we do have to be careful, because we can't recapture on a3 um, right away, because here they'll have knight to c4, and that will come with tempo, and then they'll have control over the b6 square, which will be uncomfortable. So all we have to do is instead is just hold off on that, bishop b7, if um, bishop to d4, castles, rook b1, and knight to d7. Now with b6 square covered, we're ready to take on a3. White doesn't have time for rook to b3 because knight to c5. And here we would threaten both the f4 pawn and bishop to e6. Move like e5. Even though we're down a pawn, this is um, very much better for us because these pawns are always going to be weak. The rook, like all of this is just, look at this harmony um, or lack thereof. And uh, we have the two bishops, so and better central control. So, yeah, most likely white will never take back on a3 just because of the way the pawns look so weak and the fact that they can't even hold on to them in the long run. So you'll always pretty much see b3 if you get this position, and then just bishop e7, queen f3 castles, bishop d3, b5, and then I can come sit on b4, and um, we have no real opening problems. Um, black doesn't really have to worry about an, an attack on the king side, um, because um, what is the white king doing um, himself? If he comes to the queen side, then we're going to have some sort of push on the queen side, so probably white should castle, and then it doesn't make sense to throw the pawns anymore. If the pawns do come up, our knight, this is why our knight's coming out this way, our knight will always have um, d7, and then can shift over to c5, and it takes a long time for white to get anything going multiple pawn pushes on the king side, and we'll have time to counter in the center. So I wouldn't worry about that. So I think I rushed through that, but I think that should cover um, all these bishop to d2 lines. I covered all the liquidations in the center, I covered the discovery, and now I, d I covered um, if we go into the lines that are very similar to the main line with knight to f3. So now I'm going to jump into um, the next portion of the video, which is, once I, yeah, there we go, is the move e5. Now this is a very really, uh, challenging move because um, it involves, I mean, first of all, it's just a, it's a space grabbing move, and we have to kind of bend over 
backwards in a few variations, but I'm going to show you how to navigate that. So after knight to e4, the most common move that you'll see here is uh, queen to f3. It's um, pretty much the most logical. Queen to f3 and bishop to d3 are, are usually played um, together. So queen f3 I, I say is the most logical just because it attacks us in defense. Um, whether or not we're actually threatening to take on c3 is a bit of a bit of a question because in most lines it's it doesn't make a lot of sense. I'm going to look at before going into bishop to d3 and queen f3 lines. I'm going to look at some of the other stuff first. So I think right off the bat, what if bishop to d2? This I don't know if I'd call it dubious, but this definitely helps us out because um, we'd love to make this trade and then just play d5. So after bishop to d3, the computer recommends a move like e6 as objectively best, um, just because it equalizes almost simply. But what you'll find is that usually the computer will have some sort of line where, after knight f3, c5, where you can get, if um, white doesn't take here, these lines are actually quite good. And if it wasn't for the fact that white could uh, play something like this, and we get positions where, well, here I have it taking, but we get positions where white just leaves the tension here, and eventually the computer, all it can come up with is to play c4. And even though black is fine, you get these positions where this bishop is just terrible for the rest of the game, and I can't really recommend that with a straight face. So um, we're not going into these lines. We're going to be um, a bit more, um, let's say, strategically minded, and we're going to play g6. So um, more than just controlling the f5 square, we're kind of leaving our options open um, because we want to trade off this bishop before playing e6. So that gets us into a couple nuances here. Knight f3 um, is probably a common move. And after bishop to uh, g4, our idea is pretty simple. We want to take on f3 and then play e6 and have this opposite colored um, bishop's middle game where we have no risk of being attacked and we can um, solve our opening problems and then start to push on the, on the um, queen side here. Here I was pointing at my computer screen like you could see that. I need to use my arrows. Um, so just to show what that looks like, you know, just castles, takes, takes, e6. This is an equal metal game um, because the development advantage here isn't felt by um, black with everything being so locked. So it leads us to another um, well, um, question here. What if at this point white decides, okay, he wants to trade for me, and so now I'll play knight h4 and avoid that. But this does... Um, notice here, uh, we have two undefended pawns, queen b6, and here I have them highlighted in red, so you can see that go from green to red. And it's not so simple for um, for white to defend both of them. I mean, it's actually pretty much impossible. So let's just look at the different ways that white can go about handling this position. Um, let's just say h3. Um, now we can just go back bishop to c8, so even though white's achieved their goal of not having a straight off our bishop, um, this is kind of favorable because now we're going to win the b2 pawn. They should um, defend the d4 pawn instead of the b2 pawn, but now that our bishop is back on c8, um, we guard the b7 pawn, and we don't have to worry about um, the rook coming to um, b1 and recouping the pawn on... Huh, well, that's not helping. On b7. So, for example, we'll get some position like this. We could lock it up right away because f5 is being threatened. Our queen can come hide, and even if they try to open us up, we can just keep it closed, and we have good control over the d5 square. We can just play bishop e7. White now has to retreat their knight, and um, we'll be fine. We're up a pawn here. So um, I should say that this is considered dynamically equal by the computer, but this is the kind of dynamically equal where um, as soon as we can figure out how to develop our pieces and start to liquidate a little, um, hey, we have an extra pawn in the end game. So, And at least by my eye, it seems pretty hard for white to drum up any sort of um, initiative play um, when we're when we have these solid controls over um, over some key squares. So that was if h3 to try to kick our bishop back. Um, let's say they go simply knight to e, um, e2, where it turns out that we probably shouldn't take on b2 because um, I can show what that looks like on um, b2. After castles, um, so that now rook b1 
can be played. Well, we have kind of a problem where um, both f5 is being threatened and um, rook 2 b1 is being threatened, and we can run into trouble in that way while we have to kind of defend against f5. So instead, I'm sorry, yeah, instead we just play e6, and um, because the knight's on e2, we don't have to worry about our bishop being trapped, and we can just play bishop e7 next, hitting with tempo on the knight on h4, and then play for c5. And um, if our bishop ever gets prompted, we could even come back to f5 if we wanted, or just trade on e2 and have um, that same sort of locked opposite color bishop middle game that I was talking about before. So I think one more variation. Yeah, you probably won't see this because it's kind of counterintuitive to play your bishop back to um, f1, but it's the same sort of idea where we're defending um, d4 in some way. If we take on b2, the rook will come to um, b1. And this is actually best here um, because we don't have to worry about an initiative um, being thrown at our king. So you'll get a line that might look like this. And even though we give up b7, you'll see that without any sort of initiative attack by white, we um, have nothing really to fear. We can play bishop h6, which is the best move. Already we have a threat here of taking on f4, where the queen will be overloaded. So after a move like h3, bishop takes f4, um, this would be really good for us. So nothing really to fear in this line. And of course, if um, white doesn't play h3, well, now they have to do something. They have to redevelop this bishop. We'll be able to um, either figure out how to trade this bishop or play knight to d7 and um, just defend the knight castle, something of that uh, along those lines. And um, I think that uh, black is definitely doing fine here. So that pretty much covers um, if knight h4, um, and which is, um, I think, the two lines, castles and knight h4, are the two lines I have paired up with knight f3. So let's say that black, um, let's say that white, rather, realizes that we are kind of waiting and want to trade off this bishop before playing e6. Well, they have some alternatives here. What if... Um, what if castles? This is better than h3 right away would just be a mistake um, because of the same problem with the double attack, queen b6 or queen b4, the same double attack. Um, and how do they defend if not f3? We just grab that. And same thing as before, our bishop is uh, still on c8, so um, we've just netted the pawn. And if, um, yeah, and if like a queenside castle or something, we just take on. Um, d4, and we've won a really important pawn. So h3 is definitely a mistake. Queenside castle, however, is pretty interesting in that it um, holds off on putting a piece here for the bishop to attack and defends the b2 pawn. So um, already any development with our bishop is, is pretty bad. Let's say after bishop to f5, because white is now well-timed to play e6, um, we run into, into huge trouble. But we can't do that that trade. And if instead we try to do something like bishop to g4, well, we have rook f1, and white is, is definitely playing with initiative here, preparing f5. And if we play e6, h3 bishop, um, f5, takes, takes, and g4. And white has coordinated well here just to start opening us up. And um, this is definitely much better for white. I think we're in huge danger here, so we have to be careful of that. Our bishop really can't develop yet, so just play e6. I know it feels a little bad um, because uh, we are kind of locking in our bishop, in a sense, on on um, c8. But here's the difference, I think, between playing e6 right away or playing g6, queenside castles, and e6. is because with the king committed to the queenside, um, well, we're just like extra encouraged to start pressing on the queen side, liquidating in the center, opening up some lines against the king. We'll get a lot of extra counterplay that we wouldn't get in the positions where we voluntarily lock our bishop the move before, and maybe white castles king side. So that's basically the ideas there um, behind um, taking on d2. So bishop d2 isn't, is not white's best try. Um, I guess I should also mention 
before I go into the bishop d3 and queen to f3 stuff. Um, what if just knight f3? Because can we take on c3? And it's not really clear. Like if we take on c3 right away, after b takes c3, I think we're not advised to um, to try to take on, on c3 and give white some sort of initiative now that the knight protects um, the d4 pawn. I mean, yeah, this would look bad. Bishop d2 would just be played and then c4, and we, we're not developed yet, and we don't, haven't played d5 yet. So our chances of locking the position are pretty poor. So probably if we have to play d5 here, but then bishop d2 comes, c4 comes really fast. This is not um, exactly what we want. So we're going to hold off on taking on c3 until we're absolutely prompted to. Um, so let's say d5. And now bishop d3. Makes sense. If bishop d2, you just take on d2, and it's very similar to before. Here now we can take on uh, c3, and now we're in time um, to play a quick c5, because um, crucially, uh, it's easier for us to lock the position um, now that we've already gotten uh, d5 um, played. So let's say bishop d2, d4, and then we can play g6, uh, castles, knight c6, queen e1. This is a line I kind of explored with the computer. And the thing is, is that for the longest time here, I was trying to find some sort of productive way to wait until we could play our bishop out um, to these squares. But unfortunately, uh, closing the position is probably best here. But uh, the consolation is that both sides have, have pretty bad bishops. So our bishop in the future can try to get out via this square if we can open up something on the queen side here. And at the very least, we're not really in any danger of, of some sort of powerful attack with the way that um, white's position is, is kind of discoordinated here. This bishop and queen always have to, one of them always has to cover the c3 square, because our queen is not poorly placed on a5. But we can always bring the queen out of the way if we want to um, push for a5 and, and b5 and b4 or something. So this position is very playable. It's pretty much equal, according to the computer. I just did feel a little bad that I couldn't find a variation where the bishop comes out to g4. But, um, well, we can't have everything. Backing up a bit here. So now let's get into the uh, most important stuff. Um, I'm not really going to show. There's nothing really individual about bishop to d3 versus queen to f3 because you pretty much play both of them. I'll, I'll show what it looks like after queen to f3, on d5, of course, um, and bishop to d3. So here um, there are two really interesting moves that are kind of similar. Um, I'm recommending one of them, which is g6. The other interesting move is uh, actually knight to a6. And you'll see why um, they're similar, because they both end up getting played. So to g6, knight e2 is probably um, best for white, because if they win the pawn, now you'll see the whole point behind having played g6 and knight a6 in some order, where we're going after the weak pawn on c2. So we're not outright winning or anything, but I'm going to show that this equalizes um, pretty cleanly. So probably best for white is queen e2. They can start with, let's say, knight f3, but this would transpose into these lines um, that I'm about to show. So I'll just do the queen e2 move order after knight b4. Or, yeah, knight b4 is definitely better than starting with bishop f5 because of the g4 possibility. Here, if g4 is played, we have h5. So this is the better move order of doing of doing things. Um, I'm going to cover knight f3 as the main line. A move like bishop e3 intending rook to c1 isn't enough. After bishop f5, rook c1, uh, you know, we can take on a2. And when the rook comes back, when we take on uh, c3, it's nice that we also hit the queen, hit their queen. So after some sort of trade, uh, we just go up a pawn. So bishop b3 is not playable. Now, this is okay for white, though, because after knight f3, bishop f5, um, castles is pretty strong. Taking on c2 right away isn't doesn't turn out so well for black. Um, I'll show what that looks like. Knight takes c2. I give this like a, a dubious mark here. Um, after g4, best for us is queen a6. And after g takes f5, 
takes, takes, takes. So if we take the queen in between, I don't think that really helps our chances. Um, this is what's given um, by the computer as best play. Um, either way, even if we traded, white is getting um, a really quick attack on our king side. And so the, we we're up temporarily a rook, but even um, this knight can't really escape um, in time. And f5 is going to get pushed, and our king doesn't have a safe haven. I just I'll just leave it at this is this is very dangerous. Um, you can explore a little into knight xc2 right away yourself, but um, we have no reason to play that when we have a clear better alternative in um, rook to d8, where we're preparing knight takes c2, but when we do play knight takes c2, we'll also have um, prepared knight takes on d4, rather than going after the rook on a1, which is uh, not so clear. So also, I have to mention that white doesn't really have an alternative besides castles at this point, because if we're allowed to take on c2 with check, then we'll definitely just be winning um, a rook or an exchange. So going into castles and rook to d8. So now white, this is a little awkward for white. Probably best is bishop to e3. Um, I'm going to look at a couple other moves here. Well, actually, probably not best. Um, bishop e3 probably isn't, I'd say, best, but I don't think white has an alternative that gives any sort of advantage. Bishop e3, I'll just look at this first since I already mentioned it. I'm just going to take c2, and we can take on e3 because the bishop is poorly placed on e3 here. We have a couple options in um, in e6, h5, or bishop g7. They can all be played in some sort of order. And I think probably the most logical is to start with e6, and just because the reason why h5 is a good move is because um, it's what we'll play whenever h3 or g4 is... Um, is threatened, trapping our bishop. If we had played e6, that is, and so it's like a it's like a precautionary move. And I'm not going to play bishop g7 right away because if white wants to come take our bishop, then we're going to take back with the uh, g pawn and open up the g file. And so um, we can just hold off on that for a turn to see if white does that, and then our bishop won't be best placed on g7. So from here, um, we can develop how we see fit. Um, we can play h5 if we want. Our bishop can come to e7 or g7. Probably e7 is pretty good. And um, we can even castle. And if then, after castling, knight to h4 is played, then our king can hide on uh, h8 after we open the g file, and we can just operate in that way. And we're playing against this pawn the whole game. Our bishop actually, yeah, I was saying bishop to g7. Bishop to e7 makes a lot more sense as long as the knight here, because it would um, can go to e4, because it would cover both of the entry squares. So, yeah, bishop e3 isn't a problem guarding the d4 pawn. Let's look at the next move on uh, knight to e4. Here, I think we have a really nice move in uh, queen to a6. Um, just to note that the computer um, was just showing a repetition here as best, and that queen a6 was better in response to e5 on um, knight e4. So, white can try to get some sort of initiative here. If they take on a6, then... You notice that we're attacking the knight on e4. They can't really defend that because then we come back in knight to b4, and there's there's no good way to uh, defend c2. So after knight to g3, we would pick up the pawn. Um, we're not up a pawn because we did sacrifice a pawn already, but it's the same sort of um, funny funny pawn structure that's not so easy for white to play with. So they probably won't take. They might play c4. Um, as like a let's say, a, an active way of preventing the queen trade. But then we can take here and take on c4. And we just have to play smart moves to um, stop any sort of initiative by white e6. Um, if they take, we can just play queen to d5, queen e2, castles, and black is fine. So backing up a bit, that was if knight e4 h3 makes some sense playing for g4. And here, my first instinct was just to get the bishop out of the way by taking on c2, but there's a really important point here. Just start with the move bishop to g7. So why is this move? I, I give this move an exclamation point because it's it's very unintuitive to have your bishop on the square, but um, I'll explain why this makes sense. Because after we move our bishop from f5, we'll have this point here 
um, I'll show this here. White is going to be able to play e6. Um, and this knight will be able to come to the e5 square, which is going to be really annoying. Because here we'd like to be able to play bishop to d3. Um, um, of course, skewering the queen and the rook, or pinning. <laughs> skewer, it's definitely a skewer. What am I? I need to know my my tactics. Um, e takes f7, king takes f7, knight e5, and we're in huge danger. So instead, if we start with bishop to g7, now um, g4, we can play bishop takes c2, and bishop to d3 is a threat. There is no time for e6 um, because our bishop will cover the e5 square. If e6, we play bishop d3, and um, yeah, and if they take on f on uh, f7, we play king takes f7. So there are a couple of ways that we can kind of, if we get into this position, knight e1 makes some sense, um, covering the d3 square and attacking the c2 square. But here we can just back our bishop up and kind of liquidate um, the pieces. The rooks aren't touching each other anymore, so um, our bishop isn't in danger on b3, so we're fine. If, let's say, we move like a3, it's not really much of a threat. We can just bring our bishop back to b3. So, um, yeah, and so... Yeah, just bishop d3. So that covers all those lines. And I wonder, is that... Am, am I done here? With the, these lines on... Sorry. I'm speculating to myself because I can't see... There are so many lines here that I can't see all of the analysis. I'm wondering if I'm done with the lines after e5. Uh, no, I have one more option here. Rook to d1. And I give this a dubious mark where... Um, white is defending the pawn, but now we can take on c2 pretty cleanly. And um, after queen b6, cleanly knight to b4 is just another repetition. There are a lot of these repetitions pointed out by the computer. Um, after queen to b6, you can see that white's running into trouble um, after e6. Uh, black isn't winning here or anything, but there's no way to really um, take advantage of our of our piece placement here. and the fact that our knight and bishop sit well um, actually just makes it uncomfortable uncomfortable for white. So um, I think this pretty much covers the... Uh, I covered everything pretty fast, talked pretty fast, but there were a lot of lines there. Um, definitely go back through the video if you want to uh, recap any of it. Um, but I think for the most part, yeah, important move to remember here is rook to d8, and then um, you should be fine. And um, with that, I think you have the tools needed to engage um, your opponent in the bishop d2 and e5 lines. And um, since these are some of the most critical, yeah, definitely pay attention to this. Uh, Rewatch the video if you didn't catch something the first time. And um, now I think you're completely with, paired with this video, with the uh, mainline video. You should be completely prepared to take on any of the uh, aggressive Austrian attack lines um, in the Czech Pyrrhic. So thank you for watching. and. Make sure to check out the other videos of the series so that you can play the Czech Pyrrhic in a tournament or online and at a high level.